Dagny Vander Yat. Yes, Dagny Vander Yat. Perfect pronunciation. I chop it up all the time. <laughs> to be fair, I have been up since 5 a.m. this morning, <laughs> as I'm sure you probably have been too. Yes, long um, day. Yeah, long days, long campaign. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, we were just chit-chatting about, uh, about a lot of stuff. I wish we were recording. But, I know. I think we'll get back to it. Yeah, probably. We, we have a couple of threads that we can get back to. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so let's start off with uh, you're currently running for the 23rd seat for the uh, district attorney. Yes. So uh, what does that encompass? So the 23rd Judicial District, that is Douglas County, Albert and Lincoln County. So we have a really interesting composition of obviously city, suburban, high density, and then Lincoln and Albert County, they have more rural needs, lower density. So it's an interesting district. It's a new district going into effect as of 2025. So the elections are now in 2024. And the only change from uh, what we have now is now Douglas County, Lincoln, and Albert are part of the 18th. So Arapahoe stays the 18th, and we are forming the new district. Okay. So. So Arapahoe got so large that they're like, you need your own district? Well, that, and I think difference? there was also, there, there were some financial considerations too. Okay. Because the way a district attorney's budget works is that obviously every county through the county commissioners um, contributes a certain part of the budget. And that's the budget that you're supposed to allocate within your district. Okay. And I think that our commissioners noticed that maybe some of the money that should have been allocated in Douglas County was allocated in Arapahoe County. Okay. And so they did not find that fair, right? That every third of our dollars was going someplace out else. County. Yes. Right. So I think it will allow us to allocate the resources much better in terms of what our priorities are here in Douglas County. Cool. So let's rewind a little bit now that we got the intro out. Okay. So growing up, where'd you grow up? I was born in Poland. Um, in a very interesting time. So politically, there was lots of upheaval, lots of political change. Poland was communist, a completely com communist country. And um, my parents were lucky to uh, be allowed to emigrate to Austria, to Vienna. And so Vienna was a free country, still is a free country. It was not part of the communist bloc. And that's where I had uh, the privilege of growing up until I was about 18. I have a family in Minnesota, of all, of all places. Okay. So I spend many summers with my aunt and uncle and cousins in Minnesota. My parents were always in love with America. They, they loved the culture. They traveled themselves wildly across the United States, so all the monuments. I think I was eight or nine years old when we made this two month tour through all the national parks and big oh, right cities. On. So um, I spent a lot of summers out here and then it culminated with uh, me graduated from me graduating in Minnesota from the high school. Okay. So you just decided not to come back. <laughs> no, no, no. It wasn't <laughs> one that <easy>. trip. <laughs> no, it wasn't that easy. I'm a legal immigrant, right? right? Which is a completely novel concept in today's times. I, um, I attended an American university in Europe. Okay then met my husband. We both started dating very seriously. And we, um, he finished CU Boulder uh, School of Business. Mm -hmm. And I transferred to the CU Denver School. And then we both got admitted to law school. So, so at the same time, how like, to, we're just going to go ahead and jump into that's this. That's right. That's how the big love story started. With and a bunch of books. <laughs> I keep joking that I was reading those books for him. And, you know, on some tests, he beat me. <laughs> You're just Which, giving him the spark notes. That's right. <laughs> so that was really entertaining. There was obviously competition between us. For sure. Like, who would yeah. do better? And so if he got a better grade, I was like, ah. I think that's a healthy marriage, though. You know, if you constantly push each other to be better than each other, even if it is like that healthy competition. Yes. I feel like that's really, really good. Well, and. You, you get to know where are your strengths, where are your weaknesses. And, you know, we met at such a young age. We were in our 20s. So I think we complemented each other really well and got to build life together. I, I think from my perspective, maybe because I lived it, it's easier if you meet your partner earlier in life when mm -hmm. you don't have your tics, your habits, 
right? And maybe it's easier to let somebody into your life and make that commitment. So that's what I try to uh, impart on my children. They're, they're in the dateable, you know, dateable age right now. So I said, when you're looking for a partner to actually date and consider for marriage, just, you know, keep in mind that the longer you go alone and you live alone, uh, you become a little strange. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like you really get rooted into some of your isms, right? Mm -hmm. And like, I met I met mm -hmm. Kaylee when I was nineteen, uh, and she made it a point because she was she was two years older than me, so she was twenty one or something like that. Mm -hmm. She's like, I'm not dating a teenager, <laughs> and like we were chatting when we were nine. Like I met her in November, right? But she wouldn't date me until my birthday, until I turned twenty. Uh, and it was yeah. a whole thing, but I do I do agree with that. Well, and I think. A right woman who is demanding of her partner, yeah. I think, brings out the best in you too, because oh, then absolutely. you have something to um, to compete for, right? Yes. You, you want to show your best side. Yeah. You you want to show her all the good attributes, and I think it's a it's a nice dynamic. Yeah, it's it's. I feel like it's overlooked today in today's society. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of people just have this like mentality where. If I just focus on this by myself, mm -hmm. I'm going to do a better job than having a distraction, you know, next to me. And, and I feel like that's just so, I don't know who's pushing that message. I don't know if it's social media. I don't know mm -hmm. if it's friends groups or what, but I feel like that is, it's not true. Mm -hmm. At least of what I've experienced, what I've talked to people that have successful marriages and everything else like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's, it's a reprioritization. I agree with you. I, I, I think there's only a so much that you can achieve on your own mm -hmm. and i think as soon as you have you know, children and growing family uh, that's when you taste a little bit of that sacrificial happiness so yeah. to say yep. right because you sacrifice for a higher reason yeah. you you know you just don't have the mm, well the freedom to just stay in bed and say well i'm not going to do it because i don't feel like it because you're accountable right you're accountable to your partner you're accountable to the future that you guys set out to achieve you're accountable to your children and so again it, i think it brings out the best in people if if they pursue it if yeah. they pursue that call correct yeah so finished up law school mm -hmm. what was what what was the next step how did you feel like when you got when you walked and you finally got your diploma and you're like, I passed the well, bar. Actually, I could have graduated a semester earlier, but it was a strategic decision to uh, withhold, I think it was three or four credit hours and take one last course in the end because I was pregnant. Oh. And I, I, I just wanted the uh, insurance that I had through my student life yeah. to continue on. I didn't want to be dropped from the insurance because at that point I would be unemployed studying for the bar. So I made a strategic decision. He graduated a semester early and I just withheld those three or four credit hours um, and did another spring semester um, before finally graduating and taking the bar. So I, uh, I passed the bar exam. I remember I had, so my baby, my firstborn, he was exactly four months and when I started bar. when I started studying for the bar. Okay. And so 30 days into that studying, which didn't go very well because he was screaming his a head newborn. off and a newborn is dependent on you. <laughs> and, and I wanted to do everything right as a mom too. Right. Yeah. So it was a lot of stress. I completely underestimated it. And I was on the phone with my mom basically saying, I just need help. I, I cannot do this alone. Grant mm -hmm. was working full time to support the family. So I could be the first one to take the bar. Mm -hmm. And I was stuck with a newborn screaming, not getting anywhere. So she actually flew out. She helped me with that. And that's how I was able to pass the bar and uh, become an attorney. So that was a that was a big celebration. And one of the reasons it was such a big celebration for my family is because my dad actually started law school in Poland. During but, communism? During communism. Okay. And he got maybe a year, a year and a half into it, and he just said there was just this loss of purpose because he knew the regime was corrupt and he just didn't want to work for them. It's like, what, what good is it that I will become a lawyer skilled in working for the wrong government for something that I don't believe in? And I think this is where it behooves us to study history, right? Because I think many people just don't know what happened with this iron wall that fell mm -hmm. after World War II 
and how Europe split into a free society and into a society that decided to go with the socialist agenda. Right? That, that was Stalin's influence on Eastern Europe. And it was interesting that um, Austria, and specifically Vienna, if you look at the map, it kind of reaches a little bit east into that eastern corridor. And apparently at the conference of Yalta, um, the deliberations between uh, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin were, well, if we draw this mm -hmm. Iron Curtain, which would say, this is Western influence, this is Stalin's influence, de facto, they were deliberating to actually carve out part of Austria and let it fall Just into Eastern Europe. Because remember, the rise of Hitler, Hitler was born in Austria, right. emigrated into Germany, then took over the Reichstag and right. took over as Reichskanzler and all that good, that not good stuff and all terrible stuff of the Third Reich. Right. And so when he marched into Austria and took over Austria, he was welcomed. Right? He was uh, given a hero's welcome. The Austrians went into the fold of the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. which they don't like to talk about that, right? History's Nobody wants a... <laughs> to be on the wrong side of history. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I guess there was a little bit of a sentiment that, well, then let's split Austria up and have it go to Stalin. But it didn't. Lucky for us, because that's where my family immigrated. Okay. And so, so did, it, did they immigrate during the communist occupation of Poland? Um, or was the, it right after it? It, it was in 1980 okay. that they escaped. Okay. And that was a very tumultuous uh, period in Poland because right after they uh, successfully emigrated, there was actually martial law enacted in Poland hmm. by a general Jaruzelski. So he was a, um, under, under Russia's control. So not good things at all, right? You, right? you have no free market economy. You have devastating poverty. And for the next 10 to, I think, 12 years, my parents were actually not allowed to have contact with their relatives in Poland hmm. because you were persecuted as somebody who escaped out of, you know, such a perfect country, right. <laughs> sarcastically speaking. Right. Like, why would you, why would you ever want to go into the West? The West was the enemy. It's like the <laughs> North Koreans that flee from North Korea now. Absolutely. You know, same thing is, is they're, they're constantly almost hunted, hunted down by the mm -hmm. North Korean regime. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's it's you know it's 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 interesting because a lot of the conversation around the politics of the United States right now is what is the role of government? Mm -hmm. And I do agree with you. I feel like a lot of people unfortunately don't look at history and the trends of history and when you forget history you tend to repeat the past mm -hmm. very often. Um, so it's nice to hear that you, not nice, it's unfortunate that your family mm -hmm. went through it, but it's nice to hear that you have that experience, even from your parents about, you know, uh, the, the communistic approach mm -hmm. and the, you know, I, I think, I think there's like a, there's a general understanding, like, Hey, there's a certain amount of socialism that's like acceptable. I like roads. Mm -hmm. I think most people driving on highways like roads. Um, so things like that, but then it's like this slow creep approach mm -hmm. that, you know, the government takes and it's next thing you know, they're, they're, they're infringing on things that they shouldn't be. I think fundamentally when I analyze the, the mental side of that is that the government incrementally takes away incentives from the individual mm -hmm. to, to build, to invent, because you just say, why open a business? It's just going to be taxed to death. Mm -hmm. I might work my tail off and I can't keep the rewards. So why do it? Yeah. And I think that's, that's what we saw after those 10 years when my parents weren't able to reach back out to their relatives in Poland. We couldn't travel back to Poland until a uh, political amnesty was declared for anybody who success, successfully emigrated. And that's when we just saw the devastation. Right? Nothing really changed from the point they left. Uh, it was the mid nineties, I would say. So Poland started with the Solidarność movement. We started getting more of a free market economy, but it was a country devastated by decades 
of terrible policies yeah. that did not encourage the best in individu individuals, right? Because corruption was always ramp rampant at the top levels of government. And then the individuals were just trying to make it. Right? If you did not have a little plot of land somewhere um, that you can plant potatoes, um, you know, green beans, whatever grows, apple trees, you would not survive, right? Mm -hmm. Because there just wasn't enough of flour to go around. Yeah. And, you know, it, it leaves an impression on you when my parents, for the first couple of years that we came back to our cousins, and they were the same age, right? Because I had something like six or eight cousins in Poland that I got to know as a 12, 13 year old. And I saw this stark difference of me growing up in a central city of Vienna, having everything that I ever desired. And then comparing myself to my cousins who just dress differently mm -hmm. in a very gray, depressing manner. And when my mom brought them like a specific Western shampoo, everybody was super excited because on an average salary, you could not afford those luxuries. Mm -hmm. So in the mid nineties, you could see that Western products were making it into the stores, but nobody could, could actually afford buying them. So that was still depressing. Right. You, you were still buying the like a secondary. And what was the result of that? So why, why was there, so when they opened it up and consumerism kind of, and capitalism made its way, mm -hmm. like good consumerism, right? Like well, not, not state, like, Hey, you're going to buy this state brand soap mm -hmm. in this state brand, you know, bacon <laughs> and, you know, well, I think to a certain extent, you know, the borders open and more Western companies, um, were able to invest mm -hmm. in Poland. But that also meant that they had the first, they had capital to start a new economy. Newer hotels went up, mm -hmm. right? There's like a tourist industry that developed. Uh, you started having products in stores from like French and English grocery chains. But it took a while, again, for the average person to be actually able to afford the selection that was right. offered. And there, there's such anecdotes that we have, even after I met Grant, I met Grant in um, 2000, actually 1999, 2000. And we traveled together to Poland because I wanted him to visit that particular economy. And when you got into more of the rural areas, the stores, this is interesting, the stores where you walk in and the shelves are behind the person who's helping you. So you don't get a cart and you don't go around grabbing stuff and putting oh. it into a cart and checking out. You stand in line and there's one, maybe two people helping. And you stand and you say, I would like this bread over there. I would like a piece of butter over there. Oh, and that bottle over there. It sounds like a pharmacy. And yeah. And like she... you go to a pharmacy and you're like, <laughs> hey, can I have a moxicillin? I have a sinus infection. But, but <laughs> as you imagine that, think why? Because right. that was one way, I think, to make sure that people don't walk out and steal half yeah. of the store right, out of desperation and because they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So you stand there and you point what you want and they fetch it for you. And then there's what, what Poland also had to overcome, and I think many countries that came out of this devastating communist economy, is the people who grew up in it. You know, Remember, the ones that don't have incentives to actually do well because it doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you go to law school and study well, if you're not in the you know circle of people that are in control and you oppose them, all right, have fun with you know yep, going to yep. school and spending all that time. But right, absolutely. So so one example was there is a Coca-Cola bottle on the shelf and it has a price tag. And so Grant says, Oh, I'm so excited. It's a real Coca-Cola. This is what I want to drink. So we pointed out to the helper, the store clerk. And she says, oh, I can't sell that. Well, why not? It's right there on the shelf, right? That's the Western consu consumer attitude. Yeah. Sell it to us, right? If you go to Kohl's and you want that tank top and it's your size on the mannequin, they, you, you fetch somebody and they will undress the mannequin, the mannequin. Yeah. and sell it to you, right? Because that's the rule of cons consumerism, yeah. free market. If they want it, you give it to them. Yeah. Well, she's like, no, it's, uh, we need to keep it and advertise it. Well, but you say you're out of the product. So just sell us the, That's last, the last one. Yeah. It's the last one. 
well, no, because if they come in next week or maybe next month, I just don't want to, I just don't want to put another one on there with a price so like tag. like restock it. Yeah. She just didn't want to do it. So she, she intently did not want to sell us the last Coke bottle, <laughs> but it's, let's see, it's, it's more, you know, there's another anecdote you pay with, you know, 20 or $30 bill. And the store clerk tells me, oh, go down the street because I can't give you change. Well, why should I go down the street? I see you have change in your cashier, right? Um, uh, what, whatever that is, that cashier drawer. Why yeah. don't you give me that change? Oh, because the next customer that comes in, they need the change. So wait a minute. So you're not prioritizing the customer right in front of you. You're waiting for the next one who might come in, the hypothetical customer. Was this because you had an accent by any chance? No, because I, I speak fluently Polish. It huh. is. I'm trying to explain that there is a a mental worldview that right. that generation grew up with that is really hard to understand for for somebody who has only lived in the west right right who has lived that where you walk into a store and you don't expect to stand in line for three four hours waiting to change your coupon into your allocated two pounds of flour for the you know sun. what this reminds me of uh back in 2019 to we'll say 2022 there was this global flu that will remain nameless mm -hmm. that went around and America lost its mind. Mm -hmm. Toilet paper, gone. gone. <laughs> you want toilet paper? You stand in line and you wait to get your single roll of to toilet paper. Same thing with cash. You want to pay with cash? Oh, we're not taking cash right now. I was like, why not? I have $20. This is a 20. Yes. Take yes. my cash. It's like 1985. Just give me my, you can keep the change. I don't care. Like at that point, I was like, I just want to use my cash. Yes. No, we're only, we're only doing touchless pay. And I was like, this is ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like when you're saying all these things and then to go to like California right now with where everything's locked up, mm -hmm. you know, you can't arrest anybody unless I think they steal over $900 worth of merchandise. Mm -hmm. And that's just from what I understand of talking to law enforcement and friends that are out there, that's in one incident. So if they steal $800 worth of stuff, walk out of the store and then go to another store, they can steal another $800. They don't add it up. Even mm -hmm. though it's one continuous as criminal episode, <laughs> right? And a, a, a reasonable person would say, oh, this is one criminal episode. So we're going to stack all these monetary amounts together and then we'll hit that felony level and you're going to get prosecuted. California's like, well, no, this was one and yeah, five minutes went pie and this is another. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot of these things you're saying are, are unfortunately happening. Uh, I think still current in California. I still think they're doing the locked, locked well, behind, and you know, things. maybe they creep into Denver because, you know, try to shop at the Home Depot here in Castle Rock and oh, try to luck. shop at yeah. the Santa Fe Home Depot, mm -hmm. right? It's 90% of the products are locked up and you need yeah. to have some sort of key or you need to wait for somebody to come and help you. So I think why it's important for me to talk about this is that it's within my lifetime that I have observed the remnants of what those types of policies do to a generation right. and to a country. And then I had the tremendous luck and opportunity to immigrate further into, into the U.S., uh, graduate with a law degree, do everything that America always advertised. Mm -hmm. I'd come into our country um, legally, go through the process, um, pick something that you want to study and become really good at this. And then you will be offered opportunity. And that's absolutely correct. 24 years ago, when I had the chance, right, I, I, let's say, grabbed the bull by the horns, I gave it my best, and here I am. I, I, you know, it has given me so much opportunity and prosperity, and that's what I want to preserve for my children. And that's what I want to teach my children traveling back to our origins and say, do not take this for granted, right. because those little things that we see creeping up in society, you know, products being locked up at Home Depot, um, those uh, illegal immigrants jumping on your car in downtown Denver, trying to wash your windshield. And if you don't give them a dollar or two, they might break it. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not a free trade, it's extortion. Right. Yeah. And I don't know, I just am very concerned about those symptoms that I see. Right? Yeah, they remind me of those 80s and 90s of right. former communist countries.
Right. And, you know, uh, I know we, we spoke about, you know, people coming into this country and everything. And, and you know, I have a lot of, uh, like, I have family in Florida and stuff like that. And some of the most American individuals I've ever met have fled Cuba, like communistic Cuba. Mm-hmm. And, like, you want to talk about some of the most patriotic people that you'll ever talk to. Mm. It, and, I, and I think it's because, like you said, you bring your kids out to, to, to see, like, hey, don't take this for granted. If, if This is a good analogy. If you live in a tempered house your entire life and you never go outside, you're going to think that's normal. Mm-hmm. And then you go outside and say it's the heart of winter and it's negative 20 degrees. You're going to be shocked. Mm-hmm. And you're going to appreciate your home in that tempered climate significantly more than you will if you had ever hadn't stepped out that door. Absolutely. But if you slowly change the temperature in the house and turn it down, turn it down, turn it down, they're never going to notice that it's getting colder. Mm -hmm. Next thing you know, it's as cold as it is outside. (laughs) And that's, I think, I think that's what, unfortunately, I think that's what we're seeing in America today is this. And you talk to anybody that's lived I'm trying to think uh there's a south american uh country that's really socialistic and i'm drawing a blank on it venezuela venezuela yeah talk to venezuelans that fled like legitimately fled that country because of their they they either joined a rebellion group that tried to overthrow the government and it didn't work out or and, got stuck in some cartel drug sure. wars yeah right? um but you talk to them and then they're like they come here and they're like, listen, I, I love, and they're doing it legally. Like they're mm-hmm. trying to come here legally mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you talk to them. And next thing you know, it's like, they are the most hard and fast Americans from an ideology perspective because they know how bad it can get. Mm-hmm. Venezuela used to be a relatively free society and then slowly, but surely started to chip away. Mm-hmm. And it's, you know, it's that slow turn of the temperature, the thermostat, next thing you know, you're freezing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. and corruption is rum- rampant. Oh, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, um, well, and those, and those are the symptoms that we need to pay a lot of attention to because you saw during like the pandemic that shall not be named. Mm-hmm. The how flu, quickly, the global flu, right? <laughs> the flu, how quickly things deteriorate how quickly neighbors turned against each other. Yeah. Oh, I see three cars there for Thanksgiving. They're nefariously meeting with extended yes. family <laughs> passing around the flu. And, you know, it, it's hard, but history teaches us that people give up their freedoms very quickly and willingly for, let's say, this, this feeling of safety. Right. Or this promise of safety, because it wasn't even a feeling of safety. I think it was a promise of safety. I think and that's the, what I'm scared. Yeah, about. I think in the first couple of months, there was like, I, I, I remember I was deployed when it uh, first made its uh, appearance, right? We got mm-hmm. debriefed. I don't know how much I can say on this. We got debriefed a couple months prior to the, the news event mentioning it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember thinking like, oh, this might be bad just because of the debrief I got the origins Mm -hmm. that were initially stated that were later claimed to be false, which were later claimed to be true. True. Right. Um, I gotta be careful how much I say, because I don't know if I signed anything. I'm sure I did, Mm -hmm. but regardless, there was legitimate fear in that like first three to four months Mm -hmm. after there was this realization that the death toll wasn't as high as people were claiming it to be. Mm-hmm. I think, I think the powers that be continued to play on that fear because they mm-hmm. said, Oh, this feels nice. I like having this control. I like being able to make these decisions. Oh, I mm-hmm. can shut down these businesses, but I can keep these big ones open and that, that benefits them and that makes them happy. Yeah. We'll go ahead and do that. So I think, you know, there's some cognitive dissonance as they call it. Right. Cause as you yes, say, yeah. we can't, <laughs> congregate here but we can here because we are going to be marked safe yeah right? exactly and i think we were the same way that in the beginning we were giving the government lots of leeway and benefit of the doubt and my parents live in vienna so i contacted them and i compared news and i can read french i can speak and read german 
also Polish. So I drew uh, my conclusions from many multiple sources, at least right. in Europe, to see to take temperature over there and yeah. then compare it to the narrative of what was spun over here. Yeah. And so, yes, eventually, I think a couple of weeks into it, we just thought something just does not add up here. You know, something yeah. here. Ugh. I got very concerned because I was working uh, in North Carolina when I had first gotten back from my deployment at a at a Durham police department out there. And, and I got those calls where people were calling in. Hey, my name, they'd be like, hey, this is a. Uh, this is Carol down the street, and I just want to let you know that uh, that there's four cars, and I saw I saw ten people in the backyard at the campfire. I just want to let you know. And what what did we have to do? We had to respond, and a lot of times we like literally pull up on the street. We're like, eh, I don't hear anything. <laughs> Clear the call, <laughs> you know, because there's a lot of there's a lot of really, regardless of what. The government decides to do individuals, at least in my experience in law enforcement, truly do uphold the constitution near and dear, mm -hmm. even when there's spouts of tyranny. And I would say that global flu was a little taste of tyranny uh, when it comes to right. overreach. So. Yes. And I think there were some perks, at least for us, we became very close mm -hmm. with a group of our neighbors and people were... I think you just have to get to the bottom. Do we think alike or not? Or are yes. we on opposite spectrums? Are you going to be governed by fear? Or do you believe there is a higher power? You actually have faculties that you can use and peruse the data and yes. pose those questions. And the information was available, right? If you And the conversation wanted. was there too. Mm -hmm. It wasn't immediately shut down with like, oh, just trust the science. And mm -hmm. it's like, I want to, but I would also like to have this conversation. <laughs> like. And so yeah, curious it, minds want to know. Right, exactly. Can, yeah. It's like, can you, I'm not pretending to be a medical scientist or yeah. virologist, but I can read and I can piece yep. information together. Yeah. And I think that was so offensive that it's like, oh, trust the science, but we're not going to reveal you the science, reveal the science to you. Right. It's like, what happened to peer review? Right. Because, you know, how do you explain those outliers here? Like, give us the data sets. No, we can't. And I think yep. that is very concerning that government and the big pharmaceutical companies so quickly, you know, had, had this relationship. Yes. <laughs> they used to be at opposing sides. They used to butt heads a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, there were mm -hmm. lawsuits that, you know, like, Hey, we're going to crack down on big pharma. And then immediately like, trust these guys. Yes. Like, well, and trust see, them undyingly from, from a legal perspective, right? When, when this law was removed for those pharmaceutical companies that now you cannot be sued. You have complete immunity right. for whatever happens down the pipe to people who actually use your product. That's when I perked up yeah. and I thought that's, that can't be good. As a lawyer. Yes, yeah. absolutely. As a yeah. lawyer. Right? <laughs> yeah. So back to the, back to the lawyer, we kind of jumped, mm -hmm. um, but so you finished law school, mm -hmm. passed the bar. Mm -hmm. Got a new baby boy. Yes. And life, I, life is stressful. Life is stressful. What's the next step that you took? So I worked as a contract attorney. So that just means for several different law firms who didn't have a full-time position for me, but they had contract work. So I got my feet wet over the next couple of years and I had enough flexibility to be with my family and both my husband's family and my family grandparents stepped in big time because they knew we wanted to have a big family. So yeah. it, it was neat that we had this multi-generational household that we can rely on because that gave me a lot of safety that my kids are always provided yes. for. And uh, so that's, I, I, about three, four years into this, this work, I was a little bit dismayed because I always thought of attorneys being in the courtroom. So what, what type of law were you doing? Mostly contract drafting, contract review, employment contracts. So like legal Real and stuff? estate, lots of real estate contracts for either commercial okay. deals or residential deals for builders and developers. So that, that's where my first couple of years were spent. But it was all paperwork. Right. I was like, but where is this thrilling life we see on TV? <laughs> and I remember I had several really great mentors and they told me, one of them specifically, he said, look, um, he was a, a former U.S. attorney. He said, look, 
if you want trial trial work, you actually need to seek it out because 99% yeah. of attorneys are actually paper attorneys. And then there's this small enclave of people who actually enjoy trial work. Did you not know that going while you were in school? <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> you like, just never think about this. Okay. <laughs> I think, you know, you go in there and you, you think law and order is going to be a reality. Yeah. Right. And every I'm going to be the next judge Judy. Well, well exactly. <laughs> well, or I tell you another misconception, especially because we practice probate law as well in, in the firm. So when you think of a probate attorney, yeah. You think, oh, so this is the big thing in the movies where the family congregates around the law office and the lawyer, you know, very seriously opens this big document <laughs> called the will and then starts reading the will to the family members. And then there's always the one that is dismayed, like, oh, no, he was supposed to leave me that. And that's how the film kicks off. Yeah. It never like in the have decade ever, uh, that I practiced wills, probate, and trust, <laughs> have I congregated people in my office to read them the will? <laughs> it just never happens. What's that, that movie? Way. Are you a movie nut? Do you well, watch I, movies? I watch some movies. Have you seen time. the movie Knives Out? Yes, that one I did that, see. Yeah, so it's like it's like all this drama around the will and like, oh, this I won't ruin it. Actually, I will ruin it. Spoiler oh, it's, alert. It's a good you know, movie. Yeah, actually, I won't because it is a really good movie. But you're right. Um, that's a typical yeah, that's scene. The, yeah. And it again, I, I've been in with Will's Trusts and Estates for 10 years. I've never done this in my office. So never happened. Is it just reviewing a lot of things no, and sending because it? If, if you come into the office and you say, I want to draft a will, every attorney that practices and is worth their salt would probably tailor your probate needs right. because the will still triggers the court's involvement upon your death. And we would like to help you to plan your legacy and to set up your family so you never have to step into the courtroom. <laughs> I know that's a lot of legal mumbo jumbo. <laughs> no, I mean, it's true. I'm, it, it, and you know, it's, it, it's kind of dark, right? Because nobody wants to think about mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, in my line of work, in Kaylee's line of work, we talk about mortality a lot. Um, but the general population doesn't think about it. No. The general population thinks, I'm going to be fine. I'm 25 Absolutely. years old. I'm going to live until I'm... 106, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, you know, if, if, when, when you, when you start thinking about, uh, is everything in order, you start realizing how much is not in order yes. and you're like, man, like who's going to take care of this. And if you, and if you don't say it's going to be your significant other or your next of kin it, and it's it like, can be costly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and God lots forbid of delays. if you get divorced and you never updated something mm -hmm. and it's like, yeah, you, you know, you know, exactly. Those are the pitfalls. But I guess that's coming back to my beginning stages of my legal career. So you're sitting there, you're like, man, I'm just <laughs> doing like, a bunch of paperwork. I, I see the office boxes. I just mm -hmm. don't see the courtroom. So uh, I started, I applied to the district attorney's office because that's where the U.S. attorney told me to go. Which one? That's the 18th Judicial District. Okay. So that's Arapaho. Back then we lived in Arapaho. So it was just Caddy Corner from my house and they weren't hiring hmm. but i walked in what year was I, this time frame wise so i would say 16 15 years ago okay if i think we're so pretty like close 15, 15 years ago okay give or take yeah right I, I, they say like after you turn 40 <laughs> everything <laughs> yeah things become like ish yeah Ask me my kid's age, and sometimes I'll give you the wrong answer depending on the day. Mm -hmm. so. But so I walked into the office and I spoke to a gentleman in HR, and he gave me the news. Yep, you are not hiring. Mm -hmm. And I said, but look, you can't pass me up. I have experience. I just want to see how the office works. And I will do, like, if you need me to carry coffee, your papers, whoever needs somebody like your government institution. Don't you want volunteers? Yeah. I won't charge you. It's an offer you can't refuse. Probate. <laughs> and since he couldn't, no, since he couldn't get me out of the office, he said, you know what? I'll set you up with the economic crimes unit. Let's see. They have a lot of paperwork. You might come in handy. And so for a couple of weeks, I was a volunteer at the office. Right? Whatever they wanted me to do, I did it because that's how much I wanted to get a job. Right. And eventually it was just my luck that I think one or two deputies, deputy DAs left the office and they had a need to hire somebody, which means background check, right? You're yeah. working for the government. 
somebody with a license, somebody with experience, somebody who would be trainable quickly. It's yeah. like, well, I'm right here. I have my I, key card. I have the key card. I have card. access. That's right. <laughs> Let me in. <laughs> I, I know all of you, right? So, uh, and at that point, my supervisor and boss uh, recommended me to the elected DA and they had their little HR powwow and I received an offer and I was happy as a clam. Like super I quick. Like, Yay. <laughs> Right Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of things came together. I think I was there and they saw my dedication yeah. to the office and there was a need. So that's how I started. And then right after that. Did you like, did you, uh, do you ever watch Lord of the Rings? Yes. So mm -hmm. who's that guy that, uh, that like whispers in the ear, worm tongue or something like that? Oh. Were you like talking to the DAs like, Hey, there's a better opportunity down the street. Should Pretty probably, much. You should well, probably I'm, go apply somewhere look, else. I'm, I'm a social person, so <laughs> I think um, within just a couple of days, right? Yeah. I, I knew most of my colleagues, everybody from the person at the front door, the secretaries, the paralegals. And I just like people. Well, yeah. What can I say? I like people. Hopefully, they'll like me back. They must have because eventually they hired me. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then, you know, I got my badge. I was sworn in and we had it on camera and I transmitted it to my parents. And it was like the proudest day. Leslie Hansen, the assistant DA, swore me in. And there I was. And very quickly, I became known as the Terminator. Interesting. Yep. Mm -hmm. So the story is. What's I was about to say? What's the uh, well, every name normally defense, comes with a legacy? So, yeah, so when so. You're, when you're a prosecutor, right? You're the new kid on the block, especially defense attorneys and public defenders. They like to test you. Oh, right. It's like I well, can you know, she's so, she's all tough, but when push comes to shove, she'll cave in, and. You know, I think they learned very quickly that that's not how I'm going to roll. And I got the monitor the moniker, the Terminator. I have this one story where one of my docket partners took over my docket when I was on vacation and I came back and a big chunk of my cases was simply gone. And I said, what did you do to my cases? Where are all my cases that I'm supposed to handle? And he said to me, well, all I had to tell to the defense attorneys is like you. You better take this deal right now Let's because next out. week she's <laughs> back. And his quote was, she's hell on wheels. So, and then, oh, I understand. This is not going to be a better, you're not <laughs> no, going to get a better no. deal than this. So, uh, yeah, apparently, you know, the word spread, people added onto the docket, which means basically even though your court date might be a couple of weeks ahead of time. Yeah. Defense attorneys were calling each other going, you better go in right now. It's steal of a deal. <laughs> she's out till next Monday. <laughs> So that's awesome. And then uh, and I think another fun story that I have with my, uh, my accent with the DA's office is this was very early on. I think I was covering a uh, first appearance court, which is like traffic docket, yeah. right? So it's like the, the petty offenses, the small citations, but they have to be covered. Were and you, were you acting magistrate? No, so, no, no. So I, no, no, you still have the prosecutors assigned. Right, that deal the traffic offenses. Now it's different because oh, okay. now I don't really know what they're handling at FAC here in Douglas County. But not that I worked there. <laughs> but they're supposed to handle the first appearance on all kinds of smaller tickets. So yeah. it's in like I don't know, smaller theft. Yeah. Smaller, like maybe like, like petty a, offenses, like yes, trespassing, 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 maybe like a four point ticket, careless driving that did not result in an accident. Yeah. Something again that you can handle and possibly plea bargain without effects down the road. Right. Again, yeah. there's no victim. Can I pick your brain on that? And then we'll get back into the story. Oh, yes, I think yes, it's yes. just uh, for, for the layman, mm -hmm. people just tuning in that aren't savvy in a good note. They haven't been part of the criminal justice system or the court system or they don't have any friends in it. So mm -hmm. how does this whole process work? We'll go through, I'll explain the law enforcement side and oh, then yeah, perfect. Pff, you get the, you get the case report, right? So I contact somebody at a Chick-fil-A, refuse to leave, meets the statutory requirements for third degree trespassing, probably disorderly too, because they're cursing up a storm and there's family, everybody, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But I'm a, I'm a no nonsense guy. I just charge whatever is applicable. So you get third degree trespassing that comes in. It's a petty offense. Uh, they're brought in, say, because they refuse to leave, they brought in, um, there's like some 
chapter 14 code or something like that that allows petty offenses to be arrestable especially with certain criteria but anyway so they the bond set trial date comes up well you give them a citation right there sometimes i arrest them mm -hmm. so some so if if we go cite, yeah mm -hmm. so two ways so if, if i go the citation route and i'm like hey i'm going to cite you i give them the citation then they leave i type up the report explain all the 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 facts of the case you get my report I'm assuming mm -hmm. in the docket mm -hmm. as well as whatever the citation is and their information and whatever and, return date you put in there. That's the first appearance date. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and do you get the, I, I normally include the criminal history in there too, but I'm sure you guys have access to that. So they put a shook. file together. Is right? it a the shook? Law enforcement conveys that to the district attorney's office because there's still two separate offices, mm -hmm. even though we're considered law enforcement too, we're separate office. Um, because again, we're not out giving the citations and doing the investigation like you do. So we, the district attorney's office receives that file. We call it discovery reports and we set that on the court's docket, right? That's the date that you set for that specific citation sure. or summons. Yep. And, and that's first appearance. First appearance, right? And that's also because this is a criminal proceeding, and I think people need to understand that civil law and criminal law is insofar different that in civil court you have plaintiffs and defendants, but the plaintiffs are private people. Mm -hmm. In criminal, and so are defendants, or maybe corporations too. But in criminal court, the charges get really brought by the district attorney in okay. this jurisdiction because it's a crime that has been committed or an offense against the dignity of the people in this district. So that's right. why when the district attorney enters their appearance on the record, they appear on behalf of the people right. against that particular defendant. So sometimes people use expressions like, oh, I'm a victim, they stole my car, I want to press charges. But technically, and that's where a lot of I think a misunderstanding is if there was an error in the investigation or the evidence doesn't add up for whatever reason, if the district attorney evaluates this case and says, but I cannot prove that case at trial, there's just not sufficient evidence. Evidence beyond reasonable, reasonable doubt. doubt right. Then they should actually dismiss that case because they're right. not, they're not uh, pursuing a conviction. They're pursuing justice. Right. Prosecutors have their additional code of eth ethics. So attorneys have their code of ethics, but prosecutors have additional laws and rules that they're supposed to be abiding by. So victims, again, sometimes get very frustrated or victims of crime where they say, well, it's such a great case. Why wasn't it prosecuted? Well, because sometimes, you know, the prosecutor might determine it's just not in the interest of justice because the evidence might be unclear or missing or you know if law enforcement makes some mistakes right your 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 constitutional rights might have been violated and then they anticipate that so much evidence further down the line might get suppressed that you just can't win the case you can't prove it right so but the victim is not ultimately the person who's deciding is this case going forward or not they're a witness a witness, victim and witness yeah. at the same time. They're the victim of mm -hmm. the crime that occurred, but they're truly the witness. If A lot of times they're the witness because they, they witness it happening either to them or to their property. Abso absolutely. And um, and see, but, and sometimes you have jurisdiction where you could have a criminal case where the DA chooses to prosecute the case, and you could have concurrent jurisdiction where the plaintiff can also bring a case in civil court. But then, of course, to, it's yeah. on their own dime basically yeah, i think it's 25 bucks <laughs> for the public to, to tune in that you covers your somebody. parking ticket yeah <laughs> that you exactly. will get <laughs> nothing more yeah i think that i think that helps out a lot so when you uh so you're as the as the da's office um what are these additional things that you're taking into consideration when I guess like who's influencing you as like when you first got on the job as in we'll say a vehicle trespass because mm -hmm. in my experience when i was in uh i can say what i was working at the aurora police department a significant amount of the stolen vehicles i was finding 
were getting pled down, even though they've had multiple, like their criminal history showed that they were, in my opinion, a serial car theft mm -hmm. thief. Mm -hmm. um, but they were constantly getting pled down to like mm -hmm. vehicle trespass. And it was, and I, I would, I would inquire like, Hey, was it an issue with my report? And they'd be like, no, your report was solid. I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, then what happened? They said, well, it's in the interest of justice. Yeah. And so I would ask, I'm like, okay, there's gotta be an answer to this. Is yes. the jail overcrowded? Are you guys overstacked with like dockets? Like what is going on? Right. And how, I mean, we can really get into the weeds here, but I think that's also an endemic of what is happening in the district attorney's office today, right? Where what's supposed to be happening is that if you have, as a district attorney, at least that's how I approached cases, if I see somebody who has a serious criminal history, because that criminal history is available to us mm -hmm. as well, right? So you see a pattern. You see a pattern that they fail to appear in court, right? You see that they start with disorderly conduct and all of a sudden they graduate, quote unquote, into more serious offenses. That's somebody where I don't want to just, you know, plead a case down. Mm -hmm. The reality is, Right, with the amount of cases filed and the amount of deputy district attorneys, prosecutors working in this particular jurisdiction, you cannot take every case to trial. It is, it, it's just the budget is just not there. That's why we have the plea bargaining process. And I think people who qualify for a plea bargain should receive one. Mm -hmm. right? And it, it saves resources if you can tailor it. Uh, where, a trial is an expensive endeavor it is. because yep. remember that's when you get the jury summons and you have to appear and you have to dedicate a week, maybe two weeks. Depends. Is it a misdemeanor? Is it a fel felony trial? It, it's an endeavor. So you want to be very careful about the cases that you actually do take for trial because it's an allocation of resources, right? The police officers have to come in and testify from the taxpayers mind you. Yeah, this, it, is, this, is, this not is all just, the same budget, right. right? So you, rather than patrolling I-25, right, you will be called into court and you spend an afternoon sitting on the bench because I, as an attorney, can give you a rough estimate when your testimony will be needed. Sure. But there's always, well, the judge could take more time, the jury could take more time doing their lunch break, whatever, right? There, there's something that defense counsel throws into the mix and we have a surprise in the case and you might be sitting in the hallway for a long time. Right. <laughs> so we want to be sitting careful. <laughs> we want to be careful which cases we do take to trial, but it's a fine balance because jury trials are also important tools for prosecutors right. to get to know the community that they're actually serving. Because remember, you have, just like in the sheriff's office, you have an elected sheriff, you have an mm -hmm. elected district attorney, but they can't do all the cases, all the investigations on their own. So they hire deputies. That's why I call them deputy sheriff, deputy mm -hmm. DA, or we also call them prosecutors, right? So you have a chain of command, and those are the people who cover those cases for the elected DA. So the D elected DA is very much a a policy head, right? Because you, you shape the policy, you should be diplomatic, you should be knowing what's going on in your district, what are the pervasive problems. So you should be a good liaison with your commissioners, with your council members, uh, mayors, business owners, mm -hmm. to see where do we need to allocate our resources to serve our community the best. And if there's, let's say, a gang that has moved into the district that starts operating and we see a pattern of those thefts for cars or whatever it is, or break-ins, mm -hmm. then that's what we need to focus on, right? We need to cut their feet off, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> we need to make sure that they get appropriate jail time. So when you plea bargain as a prosecutor, all of those considerations, all that knowledge should weigh in how you handle this case. And what I notice is maybe because of lack of training, or maybe because it's the leadership that is wrong in the office, people just get cozy, right? Because it's easier to just say, oh, it's a car theft. Well, do some probation, pay like a small little fine and get out of my hair. Right. Right. But you and the prosecutor, we see that there's a history, right? This person yeah. has graduated. Cause I've got, I've got access to the history too. <laughs> and I look at the history and a lot of time, and most of the time it's post facto, even though I print it out, I have to 
lot of these cases happen a year and a half, two years later because mm-hmm. they just never either show up and then they finally get caught again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I need to like refresh my knowledge. I'll have a subpoena request and then it'll be like, oh, they pled out. And I'm like, okay, well, what did they plea out to? Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's it's like, this is a good mediation. It's mm-hmm. like, hey, it was a sentence up to, up to 10 years. We're doing five years uh, with probation of five years after that. I'm like, well, okay, that's, you know, five years is a long time for someone mm-hmm. to sit mm-hmm. in incarcerated, hopefully mm-hmm. bettering their lives, especially with the amount of resources that are in jail facilities and prisons nowadays. Mm-hmm. You really turn your life around. Um, and that's speaking from my father, this is kind of personal, but my father was incarcerated for, I think four years. And that was a pinnacle moment that got his whole life turned around. Mm -hmm. So what was I saying? So, so a lot of times it's, I look at the the history afterwards Mm -hmm. and then I, then I inquire what the plea deal was. And then in my brain as a citizen of this County, Mm -hmm. I sit there and I go, well, this isn't proving anything. Mm-hmm. He's going to go up to Denver and say like, oh, because a lot of them, oh, the reality is, is a lot of people come down to Douglas County, commit offenses and or get caught in Douglas County. And then their cases either get wrapped up in ours. Sometimes I have to go up there and testify and stuff, but a mm-hmm. lot of times they're here. Um, and, you know, criminals talk to each other. Mm-hmm. So next mm-hmm. thing you know, they're like, oh, they don't really care about this. Just go down there and do it. Mm-hmm. Like they'll, they'll, I don't think Douglas has that reputation. That was more of my experience in Aurora. Um, You know, living in Douglas County, I I feel. But if you have that disconnect where, yes, you could receive a citation or an arrest by law enforcement, but then the DA doesn't follow through with the charges, then you still have a problem with the reputation because law enforcement can spin their wheels all they want but nobody's going to be held accountable. There will be no incarceration. There will be no penalty and the victims will not get their restitution. Yeah. And so so that still creates a problem. You have to have the DA's office and law enforcement pulling together. mm -hmm. Separate offices, but a a good working relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, It leads me into, you said something in that, uh, in that little segment, you talked about leadership a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the DA position, in my opinion, is you are the leader of these, uh, the deputy DAs. Leadership can be defined in many, many different ways, but Mm -hmm. how do you define it? Like internally and things like that, how do you view it? Well, I would like to have somebody that pushes me, right? If I were an employee that recognizes my, my efforts and somebody who sets high standards of achievement. So if I have that person as a leader, I want to follow that person. I see the competence, I see the tenacity and the ambition. So I I want to perform better and I want to be recognized for it. I don't want necessarily a leader who, you know, if it's the team who helped, takes all the credit for it, because it's all about them, right? And then leaves you behind because you're like, I had that brilliant idea. We just implemented the change. And now, you know, they get all the glory. So, you know, that's, that's where I come from. I, I follow people who impress me, who have achieved something, who have fought adversity. And so that's how I would like to lead the office. And I want people to say, wow, she brings in a lot of experience. She brings in a lot of acumen in terms of business and how she would administer the office and set this new vision for us. But I also would like people to know that we have an objective data driven approach and your contribution and your hard work will absolutely be awarded. Mm-hmm. Rewarded, actually, right? Rewarded and right. incentivized. Because that, I think, is the biggest thing that we need to straddle between government offices that just get too comfortable. Because think about it. Here's your $12 million check. That's the budget for Douglas County. You have $12 million. Just do the best you can. I, 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 would, no like, yeah. I would like to have a $12 million check for my law firm. For sure. like, oh, <laughs> I'll show you how I can run that, baby. <laughs> right. right. But... You know, for a business owner, it's always 
does this program work? I've invested so many dollars. Who's actually using this, right? right? Do you use it? Is it helping us? Is it not? Like, why do I pay for this? Like every time payroll comes around, you have a reckoning with your investments and your dollars. <laughs> and that's just not the case, you know, with, with a government entity because they just, they just get comfortable. And I think that's even more important that, that people and taxpayers demand that accountability and transparency. And every, and here's the thing, every DA always says, you know, I'm speaking as a voter, I will be the most transparent DA you've ever seen, you know, everything will be laid out there. And then voting rolls around in four more years. And are we holding their feet to the fire? No. Right. <laughs> and so since I've left the office, I worked for Carol Chambers. And so she was term limited because as a DA, you should be elected four years and you can go for two terms. Then in this district, remember, we're still talking about the 18th, right? right? But now the 18th will splinter off, right? We're yep. becoming a new district. George Brauker was elected for four years. Then he was elected for another four years. He was term limited. His second- And that's for the 18th. Yes. So but that two terms. Yeah, but that also 18, covers Douglas County. Right? Arapahoe, Douglas, Albert, mm -hmm. Lincoln. And so- Split, 23rd, Douglas, Albert, and Lincoln. So, you know, if you draw a Venn diagram, right. <laughs> Douglas yeah. will still be, yeah. you know, the, within that DA's purpose. Yeah, yes. And so yeah. then I understand John Kellner, the DA, because my husband and I, we are very involved in elections. He's a district yeah. captain. I've been a precinct captain. So we always go to caucus, to assemblies and all that, that good stuff. We supported John Kellner. We voted for George Brockler. That was the person who was on the ticket. So then his George Brockler's right hand man, John Kellner ran for office from within the office. For the 18th. For the 18th. Right. And this was, what? do you know what year this was? He took office in 2020, okay. January of 2020. So he's done four years so, so far. So then his term will be up in 2024. And he just announced because John Kellner li lives in Arapahoe. So he cannot run for this new district. Correct. You have to run where you reside as a DA. So he can only run for Arapahoe. But he just said, I'm not going to run for Arapahoe. So Arapahoe falls to the Democrat, Amy Patton. She ran last election. there's no Republican running? There's no Republican running in Arapahoe. So it's turning, turning completely blue. So now we have a pretty, quote unquote, red district, pretty Republican district that was historically tough on crime. Mm -hmm. And we have George Brauker running again. And we have myself running as a concerned voter who says, you know what, George Brauker, thank you for having served eight years. There was a time for you. But now I would like some fresh eyes to look at this office. Because yeah. if you get into the office again, that will be about 16 years. Yeah. <laughs> That's a little what bit did he, too much. What did he do in the four years that John was in Arapaho? So or the 18th, he, I I, as far as I know, he uh, became a radio show host. Okay. And a political pundit. So he releases newspaper articles for the Denver Gazette. And remember during his term in office, I think it was 2018, 2019, he threw his hat into the race for the governor campaign, but then he jumped off from the governor campaign into AG, attorney general, that's a statewide office. Mm -hmm. And now after his break with a radio show, he wants to come back to be the DA. So yeah. for me, my biggest concern as a voter is again, I everybody runs on transparency. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point in time, really, like, can we trust you to have eyes on this office? Like, who's reviewing this budget? Who is reviewing the contracts that we have? Yeah. The money that gets spent, right? Even John Kellner, he ran on, oh, this will be the most transparent office. And I look at the budget that was posted on the DA's website. I review the files. First of all, you know, there's only so many budgets available, but the last one that was actually posted was 2022. So we don't have 2023 budget. Right. I piece together from what the commissioners have on their website, what the budget allocation is for the, uh, for the district right now. But you can't really read the budget where it's, okay, Douglas County, this is how much we spend and this is how much 
we get in services and the same for Albert and Lincoln, because it's like one big blob, like everything is just like aggregate, Arapaho, Douglas, Lincoln, and Albert. It's just one big budget. Right. So, so now you have if you ask me today, okay, so if you take over the office in 2025 and I get sworn in in January, how's the office looking like? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I know that there's an office because the district attorney's office is right here in Castle Rock, right. right in the courthouse next to the jail and the sheriff. And I can tell you from my best estimate in terms of how many cases get filed in Arapaho and in Douglas, because those are the biggest jurisdictions. Sure. I'm thinking we have probably about 60 to 70 full-time employees in the Douglas County District. Right. And is that a majority of the cost is the salaries for the employees, the deputy DAs and, and whatnot? Pretty much, right? Because you have paralegal, you have secretaries, uh, you have the prosecutors, yep. and then you have probably some data support because yep. there's like big data storage, all the fancy stuff that you have in this. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> right? So those, I don't know if they're full-time employees or if they're consultant on a consultant basis. I, yeah. I don't know. I can't tell you. And again, it's my best estimate how many people we have currently in Douglas County. So if you get elected, um, what is what is one step that you're going to take the, to be more transparent? Because mm -hmm. I, I myself, I, I've looked at, uh, for other reasons, I've looked at uh, county funds, just out of curiosity, see how much the county has. That was a that was terrible. Like if you ever look at the county finances to try to figure out how much a county has in money, good luck, because mm -hmm. they send you just. And I'm sure you've seen it. They just send you so many numbers <laughs> that you're like, how am I supposed to figure this out? Um, Let's see, and there's there's just no need for that. No, there's no. I just want a number. Exactly. I just ask for a number. Just give me a number. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'm asking is. Uh, what is a way that you plan on having that transparency to where people know like, Oh, okay, this is where my prosecute, these are where my mm -hmm. taxpayer dollars are going towards prosecution. Are they going towards crimes that I care about? And not mm -hmm. to say like that, that should influence a, you know, district attorney's decision-making on what they prosecute, what they don't. But I think it, you know, that it, it involves people in the community more. Mm -hmm. So I guess what are some steps that you will take? Well, the biggest disconnect, well, first, first, like make the budget user friendly because just posting the budget that is done by a professional CPA, right. And gets conveyed to the County and posted online. I, I don't think that's sufficient. I think there needs to be a little bit more explanation. What, you know, there's just like big numbers, like $50,000 for this. Like what? Yeah. coffee <laughs> mugs no yeah. just kidding. <laughs> floral decor like i don't know I, I really don't there's just a lot of line items where your eyebrows just shoot up it's like oh i would like to know more i'd like I... fifty thousand yeah. dollars how do i get that deal <laughs> right so yeah. i want something that actually makes sense to the average citizen right cool. who just wants to come in and say so can you give me like this pie chart can you tell me roughly where everything is. And sure. I think that's data translation, make it where nobody falls asleep looking at your 50 page budget. And I think the voters have a right to demand that accessibility. And that's what elected officials should provide in addition to whatever the rigid budgets are, right? sure. their standard yep. procedure is right. Because I think that's something easy that we can deliver. The other big missing link for me talking to law enforcement and trying to glean numbers from the DA's office right now, when the sheriff, let's say files or police department files a hundred cases, hundred felonies, what happens to those cases? So I know you as law enforcement officers, you get the letters like, Oh, remember that car theft you prosecuted? Oh yeah. I pled it down. Mountain. Yeah. I pled it down. Yeah. I let him go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> But that's a case by case, but now right. we need aggregate numbers, right? I need to have a yes. link of the hundred cases that come in. What happened to them right here in terms of percentage, how many were dismissed, how many went to trial and if they, because those are, and how many were plea bargained and mm -hmm. how were they plea bargained by how many steps did we reduce like from the highest charge to what they actually felt guilty to. And if there's like a huge discrepancy, why? Right. Like if, if somebody is stealing a car and then they end up with like a petty theft, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's like, well, that's wait, stealing 
from a Walgreens, you know, like a chapstick yeah. is not the same as stealing a $50,000 Volvo or whatever it was. Yeah. Right. That just doesn't add up. So we just need to dive further into that data to analyze what our taxpayers are actually getting. And that is what's being hidden right now. Yeah. And, and frankly, I don't know, because going back, right, every DA does something completely new. So going back, you, you can't go back to what happened in 2015 versus what happens today. You're talking as far as like cases go, mm -hmm. like what cases we got, what cases were dismissed. It would be nice to know why the cases got dismissed mm -hmm. too. Well, like, exactly. See, that was my other thing. If there is a <clears throat> big percentage of cases that gets dismissed, I think we should look into that Yeah. because why is it a problem with the investigation? Why couldn't you prove that case? Right. I think the prosecutor should answer. And, and again, don't take me wrong. I'm not going to penalize a prosecutor for doing their job because I did make the distinction that you should seek justice, not just a conviction. Right. But, but I also don't let that go because that's waste, right? If, if, 10% of the cases don't make it into a plea disposition or a trial. That means your time that taxpayers paid for, your investigation should have been spent someplace else. Yep. Right? And that's what we need to find. Where is where's that hidden link? How yeah, can we then... make it better? Is this a training issue where the district attorney needs to be more involved in the training of law enforcement? Does there need to be more communication? See, I don't know. I, It'd be cool I, I to do a ride need. along. It'd be cool if like you want to deputy... ride with me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sure. <laughs> that would be interesting. No, I I'd, I'd, well, I've had my fair time and I've been doing this for eight years now, law mm -hmm. enforcement. And, you know, in those eight years, uh, I can relate to you when you said, you know, when you're first in the courtroom and no one knows who you are. That's a pinnacle moment mm -hmm. as a law enforcement officer because you're like, this is going to set me for the rest of my career. If I can, if I can prove that, like, uh, 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 if you sit there and they hear the little quiver in your voice, they're like, I got you. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, I'm, uh, 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 and a lot of ums. So if you can go in there confidently. Yeah. You know, yeah, exactly. But, See, and that, that was the, <laughs> that was the funny other story I wanted to tell because with my, you know, with my accent and coming into the DA's office and being in, in the traffic court, I have never at that point had any training about drugs. I am just a very healthy person. I don't smoke. Sometimes now that I'm you know, over 40, I smoke a cigar once in a while, oh on, like goodness. big occasion. Okay. <laughs> Only because Congressman Tom Tancredo kind of got me into that. Cigars but that's another nice. story, but yeah. you know, at least it has some history. So I'm a very healthy person, right? I work out, no drugs. I couldn't even pronounce marijuana because in German, Right? And that's where that's my brain sometimes lets marijuana is marijuana. So it's just a different. So sound. you're just in there saying, so I'm sitting there <laughs> and I have, I have those, you know, defendant and his counsel. And that was the time where marijuana, any type of possession was not legal. Right. right? So I'm, I'm reading, you know, the offense report. I'm like, well, I'm willing to, you know, if you plead guilty to this because you, and he's like, I did what? Well, I, you had marijuana. <laughs> he just cracks up and I just thought, look, dude, with his defense counsel, like you, you need to straighten your life up because you have an addiction to marijuana. <laughs> and he's like, I want that stuff. Whatever she says, I actually want to try it. I'd probably feel like, is she joking with me right now? Yeah. Like, what is and, but I was so straight faced and it was, it was just a, a defense counsel. I think this was just a rich kid who got in trouble. Sure. But defense counsel pulled me over and he's like, he tried to keep a straight face. It's like, you're really mispronouncing this and you're giving away that you're fresh and new. <laughs> so <laughs> defense counsel schooled me in the proper pronunciation. Yeah. I had uh, the first, the first good feedback I had was actually from a DUI case in Durham. Um, I want to say the last name was attorney Myers or something like that, but he was the defense attorney and I ended up, uh, he was, it ended up getting prosecuted and everything else like that. But then mm -hmm. afterwards he pulled like we're out in the hallway and I, you know, I always told the guys like, cause it, it, in North Carolina, if it was your first offense, it was like, Hey, you're on probation. Here's the interlock. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's very, very like, especially if you didn't crash anything and I just pulled you over, 
is very much like a eh, don't like do a little, that again slap. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, but then it gets substantially got worse if you had another one and then a third one it got significantly worse mm -hmm. for you so anyway i'm like you know the guy the guy the defendant was super nice about it he's like hey i understand you're just doing your job because i lived in the city i told him i'm like i'll probably see you around like no harm like there's no issues or anything like he's like no no, no i know you're doing your job get to talking to the attorney he's like hey i want to chat with you afterwards and i'm like oh god what does this guy want to talk to me about like i don't, I don't <laughs> at that point in my mind i'm like i'm not talking to defense they're gonna use something against me so i was like but then he pulls me aside coming to find out his wife uh worked at the sheriff's office there and he's like hey i just want to give you some tips like great great testifying and everything else like that but here's some tips here here's some tips here and he's like and, and when i start throwing my arms up it's because i'm getting paid pretty well by these by these defendants <laughs> he's like so sometimes even if i've got a really bad case i've got to like make it seem like i've got a really good case to mm -hmm. prove that you're wrong mm -hmm. um so he he was you know one of the first people that really directed me on how to testify in court wow see it's like it's all working together well yeah. there is there's a lot of gamesmanship let's say on oh, both yeah. sides prosecution there's a bunch of posturing in court i mean yeah. the courtroom is just its own little circus i call it um you know you you have fun i mean from the smallest to the most um grave cases let's yeah. say uh you you have to find a little bit of levity in it right yeah. you have to love it because otherwise you just get depressed so i I love that gamesmanship. I yeah. usually have a really good, as a prosecutor, I had a good uh, communication with defense counsel. You know, there were there were some pretty fun stories that I regaled my family with <laughs> after court. And the same now as defense counsel, because I take criminal defense cases, I have a very good understanding with prosecutors because I, I know where they are, right? I know we are two sides of the same coin. Right. And it's because both of us are doing our job there's justice. There's there's actually justice. Yeah. Because I can tell you in in a perfect world, right? If a defense attorney has a good reputation and I do my due diligence because I look at what law enforcement officers did, and then I hire my own private investigator to collect additional evidence mm -hmm. or to look at the scene or uh, write a report, interview witnesses with me, I can really fill in some gaps because think about it, law enforcement looks for what are the indicia of guilt? Your job is not necessary to necessarily to look for exculpatory evidence. The way you're trained to ask questions and to engage with a suspect is because, again, that person is a suspect, right? Right. They might have committed something, and it's your job through your techniques of interrogation to figure out how can I get the suspect to engage with me and actually tell me more, so I can find the evidence I need, right? To have yeah you have proof and the fence counsel has a little bit you know at least experienced defense counsel will look at that i'm like okay i see where you're going but there's this whole nutter side that we need to reveal and so that's what we call the exculpatory evidence and if you are a serious defense counsel who actually enjoys their job and likes their job and, and you come to a prosecutor and you say with good reputation uh because you've worked with them before and said look i looked at this case i've done the investigation i bring some stuff to your attention where there might have been some holes that we need to fill in and i think now you know in certain areas i've created doubt that what your side is might not be as convincing as we initially thought right and the insignificance of that is in a criminal trial it's a reasonable doubt exactly just one that's right. Exactly. Just, that is it. Because, you know, every offense has several elements. Yep. And every one of those elements, the jury gets instructed that they need to go, they need to be convinced that each element was proven yep. beyond reasonable, reasonable doubt. So yes, the prosecutor has a very important job and a very hard job. And it helps when defense counsel where the reliable reputation can come in, but this is where your holes are. Do we really need to gamble on this or can we find another solution? Because, you know, sometimes I go in there and I admit, I know that my client has drugs, drug problem, mm -hmm. right? I think you should do this, right? Based on what I know, based on what he's willing, he or she willing to do, what treatment yeah. might or might not work. And so if that system works, I think, and there's a basis of trust, you can definitely craft a good solution where the person's recidivism yeah. drops. 
Yeah, the reincarceration right? rate, the reincarceration rate significantly drops when you have buy-in from the offender. Exactly. It's not it's not buy-in from anybody else. You just need their buy-in with whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, with some of the more heinous ones, yes. You know, it's like we want you to buy in. <laughs> yes, but, yes. You know, you, in, you don't. So here's some time incarcerated, and we'll get you absolutely. therapy while you're incarcerated. And, and you know, that's and the incarceration thing's big for me because I think. Uh, so I went to an HBCU when I went to college and got my bachelor's degree. So it's a mm-hmm. historical black college university, and a lot of it was like, we shouldn't incarcerate people. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do mm-hmm. that. But I don't think there's an understanding in today's day and era about jails and prisons about how many programs are actually in those facilities. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. absolutely. Right. And that there, there are chances to turn your life around. And a lot of those facilities offer tours to interested people from the outside. So if, if, you know, people really want to see for themselves, it's quite the experience to Mm -hmm. visit a facility and see what's going on. And I, I recommend it not only get a ride along, yeah, <laughs> and see what the officers yeah. are doing, but also do a prison tour. I do think, uh, from a perspective of just being in this profession for so long, I have switched from uh, trying to prove someone guilty to actually trying to prove that they're innocent. When I phrase my question, or when I'm asking my questions, because if I can, if I can't prove in my interview, in my in my investigation, looking at the evidence of everything, mm-hmm. if I can't prove you're innocent. I definitely have probable cause mm-hmm. and that, and I'm submitting a really, really good case to the courts to basically mm-hmm. look over. Okay. So you just developed like an additional check on yourself yeah, to make sure that your investigation. Yeah. It's not, it's not like I'm asking like, Hey, is this anybody else's drugs? <laughs> are you sure those are your pants? You know, I'm not asking those questions, but I'm like, uh, it'll, you know, Maybe keep it more, yeah, yeah it's, it's more open ended and things like that. But I'm, I'm trying to, I'm asking questions to where if they don't answer, I still might have probable cause. It's but there's holes in the cases, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't ever like giving people recommendations, but like the more often they talk to us, the more often they dig themselves into, <laughs> into yeah. guilt, and uh, and it's very, it's unfortunate, but like Miranda is so huge. You know, it's, it's what a reasonable person believes. So if you have four officers standing around you and you're not handcuffed, do you mm-hmm. feel like you're free to leave? See, that's a factual determination. Some people <laughs> right. might be yeah. like, that's intimidating. Absolutely. Right? Especially if all the officers are I would be two. intimidated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's, I, I always try to put myself in like, in these situations, especially when I'm doing these interviews, because especially in North Carolina, we dealt with a lot of gangbangers um, mm-hmm. that were, uh, that were willing to talk most of the time. Cause there's, there's two types of rats. There's a rat in the street and there's a rat in jail. You're going to be one of them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, you know, having that consensual conversation was key, but it was always difficult explaining to like the jury. Cause the defense would always bring it up. Well, you, you detained my, uh, my defendant and you didn't read a Miranda. And I'd be like, well, he sat on the sidewalk. I did ask him to sit down. But I just stood there. I actually crouched down next to him. There were no other officers around. At no point did I say that he couldn't leave. Mm-hmm. And I and I told him I'll, I'll, it was a consensual. And most of the time, I I walked up and I said, "Hey, just so you know, this is consensual contact." Mm-hmm. And they're like, "Oh, okay." And I just start talking. Mm-hmm. And then they just dig themselves into a hole. <laughs> so it's so it's interesting. Is it, this this year, I believe, I think there's no more exception. All departments have to have the body camera. Correct. Right? Yep. So, because it, that was a long time in the making, and I think the legislature gave they gave some the leniency. Some, yeah. Some years because they yeah. they understand that it's a huge budgetary investment. Oh yeah. Imagine Lincoln, training Ugh. like Lincoln's income for their county. And they got to buy all these like body cams. Body exactly. Cameras. So like, it will yeah. be interesting to hear from you. So do you think it will help actually in your investigations now that you have to turn on the body? Yeah. Cam? So this is actually interesting. I started, uh, 2016. So right before this was six months, we had six months of no body camera. Mm-hmm. Then Vive you came around and then we implemented it immediately. Mm-hmm. And Vive U ended up becoming Axon, which is the body cameras that mm-hmm. most agencies wear these days. In having the body camera, 
not only uh, a lot of it was justifying uses of force. So it was a lot easier to explain a use of force. And as a supervisor, they could look at the computer, watch the video and be like, oh yeah, I, you see the pre-assaultive cues. They're clenching their you know fists or gritting their teeth. They're like, mm, or they're just mm-hmm. doing this death stare where they're like, and you're like, something yeah <laughs> is going or they're happen. or they're doing the you know and they're stretching their legs or they're pulling up their pants and mm-hmm. it was like all these cues not only from a training aspect but it was a lot easier to justify going hands-on with people very quickly mm-hmm. um so from an officer standpoint i remember being like six months it was a lot of typing like a lot of like Rem- again i was new so like trying to remember like oh this is how i walked up to him uh, what did i say oh this is what i said and all this other stuff to where with the body camera it became a lot easier to write those reports and then especially like in investigations so like interviewing mm-hmm. the downside to it was it ske- like perceptual right so you mm-hmm. got um graham v connor which is like the the reasonableness, the totality of the circumstances of force. Mm-hmm. When you do something, your mind is operating in a certain way. And uh, you might justify things based on the stimuluses that you have right that moment. Mm-hmm. And then when you watch the video, it changes your perception. Mm-hmm. So what I was having difficulties explaining to people, because I understand how this, like the psychology works of that. So I was explaining to my sergeants mm-hmm. because I was typing my report. And at the bottom of it, I said, this report was written prior to reviewing my body worn camera footage, period. Enter. If there were any discrepancies in what I perceived versus what mm-hmm. were actual, I would say upon reviewing the body worn, because it's going to come up in court. The, mm-hmm. A good defense attorney is going to read my report, watch the body camera footage and say, this is the discrepancy. Are you lying? And next thing you know, I'm getting a Brady letter and I can never testify again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was very clear, like, no, I'm writing this report based off my perception of what I felt in that moment. Mm-hmm. And then the body worn camera isn't me a like, I'm not trying to leave things out. I'm writing from my memory here. I'm reviewing my body worn mm-hmm. camera and explaining any discrepancies that are in between because we're just human. We're not exactly. Yeah. You don't we're not remember everything a hundred percent. And I, I think that's what is going to be very interesting. Right. I think I've, I've experienced a little bit of that transition over the last couple of years and you're absolutely right. I feel that officers are now under more pressure mm-hmm. because if it, if your report is not almost a verbatim summary of what defense counsel will find on the camera mm-hmm. transcribing that, you open yourself up to questioning, right? Because, well, why did you leave that out? Right. right? That's a very mysterious question. Yeah. <laughs> it, it just puts you in a light, as you say, like, it's not that I was incompetent. I just thought other stuff was more important from yeah. where I stood at the moment, right? Yeah. The other thing that I also see is that sometimes certain footage disappears, right? And then, especially as defense counsel, I go, well, what does your office policy manual say about the usage right now? Mm-hmm. Well, it's supposed to be on from the time, you know, arrival. first yep. arrival. I'm like, well, then why is there a click in between, right? Yeah. And then again, I think it puts officers more on the spot to justify was this accidental that the camera was off Mm -hmm. was it a a human error because we are still human right we're prone to errors or was it something deliberate yeah that you know because now you, you have this black box that you can fill and say as defense counsel and inject that reasonable doubt like look when it behooves the government we have perfect surveillance and then when my client says, you know, witnesses say, oh, this happened. It's missing from the footage. Yeah. So I, think I, I of, see yeah. more and more cases like that, which yeah, I think, worry me for law enforcement. Yeah, sake. for sure. And and part of, uh, part of the, th- again, six months not experiencing it, majority of my career, I've, I've been exposed to body-worn cameras. Uh, you say some things off cuff sometimes. Mm-hmm. A bad joke gets caught 
it gets played in the courtroom. Do you look the best? No, but mm-hmm. you just say, Hey, uh, you know, I just dealt with this scene where, and, and I think the public doesn't understand this, that, uh, that when you're exposed to extreme trauma, like mm-hmm. extreme trauma. So like you go to a scene and a kid is dead or something like that. And you're not making a joke about the kid at all, but you make a mm-hmm. joke about something. And the, the, the quick little chuckle you get in your head again, not of that scene. Say you just cleared mm-hmm. that scene. You're on another mm-hmm. scene. You make a joke about something. It's because your brain is so traumatized from the call that you were just on mm-hmm. that you're trying again, the, 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 you know, humor in the courtroom or like, yeah, the, you the bring acts. some levity to the situation. Yeah. You're just trying one to- way to release the pressure. Yeah. And it's like, man, I, it's like, okay, this just happened. And I just got on, I've got nine hours of shift left. And I've got to like keep, I got to, I've got to somehow keep this all together. I can't, I, I can't cry in front of people. Mm-hmm. I've got to maintain my discipline. I've got to maintain my mm-hmm. decision-making and all this stuff. Um, so I think, and I've had a, quite a few law enforcement officers on this podcast that talk about like the influences and, and, mm-hmm. and things that happen to them. But one of the main things I, I think is an issue too with the body worn cameras is there's this disconnect between uh, when we're actually writing the report versus when it's like body worn camera. Mm-hmm. So I'm writing, I'm not, I'm not like, okay, if we finish this interaction, I'm not immediately writing a report. I'm going to another call yeah, because there's another call down the street that I got to go handle. And then if we're super short staffed, I'm clearing that call and then going to another call. Mm-hmm. And then I'm not eating my lunch. I'm literally sitting there stuffing my face with French fries, trying to type these reports mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. I've got three different incidents in my brain that I'm trying to play through and recount everything that I did. Yes. So it it does become uh, difficult. I do. um, I know there's one guy that will remain nameless in Aurora that just for his report says CBWC, which is body worn camera (laughs) period. (laughs) And then he sends his reports in that way because he's like, I'm not getting hemmed up for lying. And that was a big thing. uh, You know, is, is people aren't trying to lie. But another thing on the body worn camera stuff is, there's a, there's a mute function. And a lot of times officers, the law is confusing. Well, because it's at such a weird, awkward location. Yeah. Not only can right? you turn it off on accident, like if you lean against something, I know when I search cars from time to time, if I lean against the seat, it'll activate the button, but most of the time it makes an audible beep or vibrates. So when I hear it or feel it, I look down and I check and I reactivate it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the buffer time, there's like a slight second of mute but the video continues. Um, what I have an issue with is uh, not necessarily an issue, but I'd be curious to see your, are you actively doing defense stuff? Selectively, yes. Mm-hmm. So uh, oftentimes law enforcement officers, because the crimes can be, the, the elements of the crimes can be very particular mm-hmm. in some incidents. incidents. And then you might have a new officer that doesn't know every single crime because there's, I don't know, you probably would know, but there's, there's well over 300 different statutes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So a lot of times we mute it. We'll say, Hey, conference we will mute it. And we're talking about, Hey, what, like, this is what I have for this element. This is what I have. And we don't want it to be recorded because then the defense will get it and say, Oh, you weren't even sure. Yes. At the time of putting my client in handcuffs on whether or not you had probable cause, mm-hmm. it's proven because you guys are talking about whether or not you have the charges. So a lot of times it's the the mute button on the side is if you see it like, hey, conference, because the state law allows for conferencing so long as the video is maintained. Um, there's that conference of like, hey, this is what I have. Do you think mm-hmm. it's good? Mm-hmm. Like, do you think, is there another charge I should be seeking? Is this the right one? Am I like, am I just losing my mind and I don't know the, the elements and I shouldn't, I should unhandcuff this guy. <laughs> that rarely happens. Yes. But, yes. So what are your thoughts I, as a defense attorney on that? Well, first of all, keep in mind, right. That the prosecutor has discretion to add or drop charges all the way until up till trial. Right. right. So we can finesse the case later and if warranted add charges or drop charges. Sure. Um, but I see, I think from just a philosophical perspective, 
I think there will be just way more litigation to come because we have a very well-funded, and you have to make a distinction between a private defense attorney where an accused usually pays or their family pays a retainer for legal services, mm -hmm. and you're dealing under with, with budgetary constraints. Okay, so I want to resolve the case to the best of my ability for my client to receive treatment or a better offer or predisposition, but we might not throw an inordinate amount of cash at this case, right? Because we're paying out of pocket and a good investigator could be charging $150 an hour, an hour right? Yeah. Because I want a retired law enforcement officer. I don't want, you know, Joe, who just opened yeah. an investigator. <laughs> this is my PI firm. How I, long have you been in business? Danny Two DeVito, days. right? Danny I DeVito mean, going like, yeah, I'll, I'll set you up. Yeah. <laughs> so I want somebody with credibility and gravitas, and hopefully they yeah. have not been fired or done something, right? Sure. Because that's something I need to look into because then the prosecutor will have yeah. fun with me. So again, there's considerations of budget. But then you also have people who qualify, and the majority of defense cases actually go to the public defender because we have a large population that qualifies for public defense services mm -hmm. and they have a budget. So it's to seem like comparable to the district attorney's office, but I understand that the public defender is a statewide operation Okay. and they request funds and they grant, get those funds granted. And then how they allocate those funds is not really for you to decide if that's appropriate because they're to a certain extent covered by client privilege as an attorney, right? Right. Because if they say, well, we went to two different, uh, you know, departments to analyze blood tests or something because we had suspicion that the prosecutors messed up with their evidence. Sure. Mishandling. Yeah. It but that's, like that's that. again, that you have an argument that's client privileged information that pertains to the strategy you picked with your client. Right. So you as a taxpayer will not get a bill. Oh, we spent $350 per lab on this particular client. You might get an aggregate number. So again, it's what I'm just saying is that it's, it's just a big organization and we don't get accounting of how their funds are spent. Okay. And I think to a certain extent, they have better budgets than your average defense counsel because they share resources, right? If, if I have, a theft case or a drug case, I have one every six months. I don't have, you know, a hundred different yeah. people in the office who wrote a similar motion. I have to tailor my motion for this specific client, right? This specific hearing. So I just don't have the benefit of a public defender's office who's doing 150 cases every day in that right. genre, right? And they're all similar. So let's say they're, they are not incentivized to always be the most economical. Yeah. And I, it's like a deep pocket syndrome. Yes. It's like, oh, the money's there. If we need well, more money, we just get more. Absolutely. So I, I think there will be a lot of litigation from what I see sitting in courtrooms, waiting for dockets and speaking to people as mm -hmm. well. I think there will be a lot more litigation with those body cameras. Yeah. And philosophically, I just have a, you know, again, you, you set up the context already. When you are in reality and when you are interacting with somebody, there's emotion, there's impressions, there's adrenaline, right? There's, there's tiredness because you had two double shifts, whatever it is, there's that human element. And when you're sitting coolly in the courtroom, you know, observing webcam footage, you cannot recreate reality. We might think we can because we're a generation raised with screens, yeah. but we just cannot. And, you know, one movie that came to mind since we talked about movies before, and I forget the captain's name, the one that uh, flew the plane into the, ri the river as an emergency landing. Oh, in New York? Yes. I forgot. The, I know what you're talking right? about. Right? But yep. if you watch the movie, right, I think experts, quote unquote, reviewed the black box data and everything. And their opinion was, well, you should have diverted to one of the auxiliary airports. Sure. Why did you crash a million dollars, you know, millions of dollars in equipment and basically passengers could have frozen. Never mind, it didn't happen, but yeah. still he was under investigation. Not, yeah, mind right? you, you landed an aircraft in an incredible <laughs> way. We're gonna we're gonna hang you up on this. Exactly. Right. right? There's there's the investigation by the experts. And 
you know, incredibly, I think what, what you learn watching the movie is that he gets vindicated because on a, I think they put all the data into a simulator, a flight right. simulator. And the best pilot experts in the country cannot recreate what he supposedly, did. well, they cannot land the plane safely in an auxiliary airport. And huh. that's what the administration wanted him to do, right? The investigative body. They said, you did wrong, quote unquote, controllably crashing the plane. You should have gone to one of the other airports. Yeah. But then they put all the data into a flight simulator and none of the pilots was actually able with limited amount of fuel, the turbine being out, right? Yep. And all the information that was coming in in terms of elevation, weather and speed of the plane, they were not able to do that landing. So it's like, so we impose conditions on you and expectations which cannot be done in reality. Yeah. And I think that is in a nutshell what um, we put expectations on you, right? And then coolly yeah. look at the webcam footage and then we're disappointed. And law enforcement should yeah. have done better. And I actually had a similar discussion with one deputy and they said, you know, one good thing for citizen academies to actually do is those shoot, simulators. Yeah. Exactly. It's called the shoot, don't shoot mm -hmm. simulation. Absolutely. So, Because this is as close as you can get to quote unquote real life scenarios where things happen dynamically and change within seconds. Mm -hmm. And how will you fare, right? Will you be this excellent law enforcement officer that you think you you are, right? Or or is there something else? And I'm talking from a citizen's perspective yeah. because they all said, well, you shouldn't have done this. <laughs> well, so what gets me too is this like unrealistic expectation of my performance. I'm on the movie theme. I'm not John Wick. <laughs> I'm not gonna walk into a room like filled with 80 people and like hip throw them and all this other stuff. Like I'm not, I'm just not that good. I do jujitsu on the side, but that's something I do in addition. Like I pay extra money to do that so I can be that's better. That's not your standard training. No, there it's not. It's not. And granted, like I teach my department jujitsu for like arrest control techniques and stuff like that. But it, it, the reality is, is people watch these movies. They watch John Wick and they watch these, uh, you know, incredible, you know, stories of like Navy SEALs. And, and it's like, mind you, being in the military myself, I've spe I've, I've got the privilege of meeting some special operation guys. They train for a very particular mission. Normally it's only about six months for the most part. Mm -hmm. They train for at least six months for that particular mission. Every day I go into work, I have no clue what I'm going into. Mm -hmm. Am I going to be the psychologist that talks to a kid that wants to commit suicide? Am I going to be, you know, the special operations guy that's got to clear out this entire building to make sure nobody's broken into it and do like mm -hmm. building search? Am I going to be the, you know, uh, MMA fighter mm -hmm. where I go against some dude that thinks the he's in the UFC? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and it, it, it is that, uh, it's this, this is, it's this expectation, especially watching body cam footage. You're like, well, I would have done this. Mm -hmm. well, uh, come on. I'm sure you would. <laughs> You're right. Why? <laughs> Why'd you tase him? Why don't you just go like hug him, wrap him, drop him down to the ground? Because mm -hmm. Colorado has recently ruled that the taser is invasive. Like it used to be non-invasive. And I've been, I've been tased. I think I'm going on six. Every time there's an opportunity to get tased, I volunteer for it because I'm like, listen, if, if I'm going to tase somebody, I'm going to be like, listen, I've gone through this X amount of times. Like you can, you can, you'll be okay. Yeah. So, and it is invasive, but it, it is a very good way of uh, apprehending somebody mm -hmm. outside of like hitting them and using a lot of force mm -hmm. because it, it's like a full body workout for five seconds. And then afterwards you are exhausted. Done. Mm -hmm. They're not always done depending on like their substances and things like that or their, their will, because mm -hmm. uh, I'm fighting for a paycheck and to go home, but they're fighting for their freedom. Mm -hmm. They're like the man from Braveheart, like ready to die. And I'm just like, I just want to get you in custody, man. Like, I don't, <laughs> it's like, you've got a warrant. I don't know what to tell you. There's nothing else I can tell you. The courts want you, you're guilty. You never showed up. Yes, it's that. Yes, come stand, stand up, and yeah. you know, face trial or whatever it is. But I, I will um, say, I will say, a lot of, um, a lot of what people are seeing is the de-escalation method. You know, it's the, mm -hmm. especially when time's given, 
um, just from an ACT instructor standpoint, so it's arrest control techniques, mm -hmm. um, we are really hitting in on the, hey, make sure you have distance. If you can talk to him, try to talk to him. Mm -hmm. you have, if you end up taking somebody's life, would you have questioned, could I give him five more minutes? Mm -hmm. Like if worst case scenario got there, mm -hmm. hindsight 2020, like what's, what's the rush? There's mm -hmm. no rush. If somebody's mm -hmm. barricaded in a house and they don't want to come out and they've got weapons in there, they're going to shut off their water. Mm -hmm. They might last a week. Yeah. Right. But there's, there's, there's really no rush in a lot of situations mm -hmm. after all the innocents have gotten taken away. But then it comes down to how much money are we spending on this? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it comes down to a budgetary thing. Mm -hmm. We can't keep this going for months. Just kind of wrap it up. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. Well, Another thing I want to throw in there is, uh, you know, social media and uh, the availability of that footage, reporters obtain yes. it or whatever, and then they only play a small fraction mm -hmm. that helps their narrative, right? And I always wonder, based on experience, well, there's way more before, but we cut that one out mm -hmm. because you want to convey a specific message that the officer overreacted or reacted too quickly or whatever it is. and. I think that's in this information uh, war that is going on on the internet. That is very, like something difficult to rein in, something difficult to control. Mm -hmm. And I think as a, you know, maybe as a district attorney and w dealing with law enforcement, that's something I would like to find a way to do a better job. Because coming from the defense side, I really don't appreciate when cases are used to make a name for yeah. yourself as a prosecutor. I think that's wrong because again, just like you said with the shoot, don't shoot, there's a person's life reputation at stake. And there might be even a fraction of a percentage chance that you are just wrong, right? That there is some other evidence that mm -hmm. at this early stage of the prosecution, we just don't know. So can you just hold off and not fan the flames in public? You see, it makes us all look bad. Let's just give it a little bit of time. Don't make any yeah. inflammatory comments. Well, and, it, and it's not justice at its root. And it's, it's not. Fair. It's not. Like, to to, to get them basically the mob justice. Yeah. Right. And convict somebody in the public's eye. Yeah. The court of public opinion is, is probably, in my opinion, out of control in this country right now because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you used to be, you were innocent until proven guilty. Unfortunately, in my experience in law enforcement, you're guilty until you prove yourself innocent mm -hmm. in my situation. And that's because the public, rightfully so in some instances, you know, demand a lot from law enforcement. But we are still entitled to the same process that everyone else is. Mm -hmm. Just like Absolutely. I don't, I always tell people when I, when I interact with them and they they have a warrant out for their arrest, but they haven't gone to trial yet. So it's just like a, it's an FOJ or FTA. So fe fugitive justice or failure to appear. Mm -hmm. I always tell them, I'm like, what are the allegations? Like, you're not a criminal, like you're not guilty yet. What are they alleging you did? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, don't incriminate yourself. I'm not interested in that. I'm not even going to write a supplemental report for whatever case you're going in for. I'm just curious, like, cause all I have is FOJ. Yes. Oh, yes. I, you know, I'm, 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 uh, they say I, I committed a robbery. They say it. I, <laughs> they say, and I I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. Best of luck mm -hmm. to you on your, you know, trial and stuff. You should have showed up for court. <laughs> mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we'll wrap this up. Uh, what do you think? What do you think is, you know, uh, and, uh, and it just kind of lines up as a presidential election. So you'll have hopefully a good turnout. Mm -hmm. Fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. What would you say to the younger generation? because they historically don't show out to vote period. Um, and then like just people focusing on like local elections, not just mm -hmm. the presidential and, and federal level. Well, you know, we can say whatever in, in terms of hopeful messages and, and do a battle cry for the young generation, but I'm more of a doer. And a couple of years ago, I figured, can I make a difference within my vicinity can I influence 10 youth, 50 youth? Like, where's the limit? And we had a chance to be part of something really great and organic during the flu episode mm -hmm. where we helped plant a constitutional church. 
And that particular church attracts a lot of youth. I think we have something like 450 to 500 families. And uh, I do in my spare time, which I don't have much, but with the help of my children, <laughs> but somewhere there, you know, if your heart is in the right place, you find time. Yes. Uh, we have an offspring with that church to run a ministry. And I think the beautiful thing is that it does touch so many youth. And since we are a constitutional church, we can be political. Right. And our politics are basically to a call to action for the children, for the teens, for the people always, you know, we just had a worship night and I asked them, I said, how many of you this year will be voting in this election? You know, hands go up. How many of you have registered to vote? How many of you have done the research, right? And so we coach them and we invite them to participate. And so I think that's the doing rather than, you know, sitting and yeah. belaboring like we don't have the buy-in from the youth and the teens yeah. are just checked out. I think there's there's a turnaround. I think a lot of the younger generation, I'm observing my 18-year-old son, my, my almost 17-year-old daughter and, and their friends. I think there is a lot of disenchantment with what the left promised this, yeah. this, this new progress. You know, we touched upon it a little bit, I think, outside of the podcast that, you know, marriage is belittled, commitment is belittled, having children is belittled, like everything traditional has been shoved to the side for one reason or the other. And the promise was a more happy, more individually fulfilling future. And I think now the chickens are coming home to roost because you have this generation of lost 30, mid 40 uh, people. No, no, but the, the lost <laughs> no, ones yeah. who just, yeah. you know, they thought, well, we just didn't didn't do the traditional yep. stuff. We want it to be different. Yep. And maybe there's just a little bit of a swing, I hope, at least to the middle. You know, don't go super conservative right away. Right. <laughs> just come to the middle and be more open to ideas that truly promise prosperity, truly promise liberty for the individual. Yeah. And see how we can achieve it because you're the generation who will carry that torch forward, right? And you, you'll be the light that goes into that future. And so that's what we love to do in our spare time. We just, you know, I actually very much involved that particular ministry. Uh, I think a bunch of them will help me during caucus. I have a group of volunteers because during caucus, which is coming up next week, you're supposed to go to different precincts in your county, in your election, and rally the troops, so to speak, because people need to run for delegate to get you elected, to get you onto the ballot as a candidate mm -hmm. so we can vote you know, in the primary and then in the general. So that's how I rally the troops. I think, you know, if I win the election or worst case scenario, if I lose the election, but I'm an internal optimist, so I'm going to win the election. I, one of the big messages that I wanted to convey to the youth, to the children is look, I'm one of you. You know me as your dance instructor on Fridays. I have no right. clue what I'm doing in my regular life as an attorney. That's my boring side. But I teach them how to ballroom dance on right. random Fridays. And then I just stepped up and said, look, you can do it too because we want your involvement, right? You can yeah. run for city council. You could run for school board. You could run for commissioner. Because what happens in those smaller offices right around here affects you more, right? Run for sheriff. It affects you more than what's going to happen in Washington. That's my optimistic message. So yeah. I have I have my, you know, 100 youth that I got Rallying to register to, and, yeah. and rally this year. That's and awesome. look, if, if every one of us would do that, right? Especially as parents, if, if you know friends who have... 17, 18 year olds, uh, encourage them, like yeah. ask them those questions. Because I said to my uh, son this year, you have the privilege to vote. Now, what are you going to do? How are you going? How are you going to get informed about who's running for which office? And what are the issues du jour, so to speak? Yeah. Right? What are the issues of the day? And so he's been coming with us to all the meetings and candidate forums. And yeah. he's just learned so much in the last couple of months. So everything is an opportunity. Let's be optimistic. Yeah, yeah. And I and I've been I I I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for I think 3 months now. Uh I think we met 3 months ago. Yeah. yeah. Or I think like right when I announced the campaign like in December. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh you know I I told you right off the bat I don't vote for a party. I vote for a person. Mm -hmm. And I can wholeheartedly mm -hmm. tell you from meeting your family, your kids, your husband, getting to know you. Uh I 
I have no doubt when you get into that position, you'll thrive. You'll you'll forge mm-hmm. a legacy for the twenty third. Thank you. Um, as you know, the first DA. Thank you. And uh, so yeah. Well, it will be my honor to do that. So you know, I'm I'm doing right everything on. I can yeah. to get that election won and to speak to people and to introduce myself yeah. and to be that. You know, well, you're leader. out there. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, <laughs> you're out there. Like every time I text you, I'm like, hey, what's the next event? And you're like, yeah, we got four already planned. And it's like within the next week or so. Absolutely. So. I think literally my, my day starts really early, you know, sometimes before six. And I just keep going till 10, 11, whatever it will be tonight. Yeah. Right. So I have to, you know, keep my juicer uh, in operation. Yeah, sure. I have like a lot of juices and vitamins and yeah. potions. Uh, yeah. Just. Well, right on. You know, be be healthy and yeah, do that marathon. Well, I'll uh, I'll attach your link at the you know beginning of this episode and at the end. That way, people can click it. Um, just get it to me to whatever events are coming up. So if they want to meet you in person, awesome. Yeah, we have one March eighth. Mar- March eighth is okay. uh, our next meet and greet, and it's a little fundraiser in the neighborhood here in Castle Rock. So we have okay. one. Pretty do you have much a location already planned? Yes, it's I. I'll put it up for you on Facebook. Cool. Yeah. All right, we'll get it out there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys.